Well, good morning to you all. There is an old, uh, there's an old joke that says there was a, a uh, man going to the racetrack and he's watching the races and uh, just before each race he would watch and the Catholic priest was coming out to where the horses were and he would go to one of the horses and he would pray a little blessing over him and then he would watch at the end of the race that particular horse would win. So he saw that the first time he prayed for number seven and number seven won. Then the second race, he prayed for number 11 and number 11 won. So he said, I've got the system now. Next, he watches the priest pray for number 13. He goes to the window and he puts everything he owns on to number 13. He is going to be rich forever. Halfway through the race, number 13 is last in the race, falls down and breaks his leg. And that's the end of the race. And the priest goes down and he says, what's going on? I pray for number, I mean, to the, he goes to the priest. And I saw you pray for number seven, number seven, one. I saw you pray for number 11 and number 11, one. You probably pray for 13 and he falls down and dies. What's going on? And he says, are you a Catholic? Well, no, I'm a Protestant. You don't know the difference between the left and last rites. How much can we expect from God's blessing? It is one of the biggest questions I wrestle with with people all the time, every day. Is it worth it? I don't think most of the people who ask me want to know, is it worth it to believe in God? Virtually everyone that he's with believes in God. The question is really more... Is it worth it to get really excited about religion, to go all the way with God? Now watch sometimes these poker channels for a few minutes. I understand none of it. All the thing I see is that there comes a time when a guy bets it all, and they call it all in. Somehow he is so sure that his cards are going to beat whatever's there, they take all the chips, and they do bet it all. And that's the question most people ask me. Is it really worth it to go all in with God, to get really excited, to get really religious, go to church every week, be here in the front row, have an office, get involved, go on mission trips, put all their tithes and offerings in, and just go all in. Is that really worth it? Will God give me enough to make that worth it? Or is it better to hold back some? Kind of pick and choose which laws and rules you really want to get excited about. Go to church some of the time, but not all the time, and just kind of be around, but not all in. Put a dollar or 20 once in a while in, but not all in. Is God worth it? And is religion really worth it? You've got to count the cost. We're going to Hawaii tomorrow. We have a little time to bought years and years ago. I can remember sitting there with a tiny little bit of money that Hilda had inherited when her parents died. And here they're giving you this incredible story of how cool it would be to have the time share right on the beach for the rest of your life. And you're sitting here, and there's the beach. But this money now is not going to be in our hands. It's going to be in their hands. Is it worth it? You count the cost. I remember being in uh, Africa to Zimbabwe. Here's the Victoria Falls, and here's the Victoria Falls Bridge. And there are people bungee jumping 300 feet, highest bungee jumping in the world. And the president of the college says, I'll pay for that if you want to do it. And I said, is it worth it to stand there on the edge of a bridge and look down 300 feet at a river <laughs> that's filled with crocodiles and hope that this rope will work one more time? Is the adrenaline rush worth the risk? It will be the time the rope breaks. Counting the cost. Is it really going to be worth it? Am I going to get more out of this than I, than I put in? The old, old, old joke I've used a thousand times about the clocks in heaven. Someone's going on a tour, and there's the clocks. There's a clock for everyone down on earth. Every time they sin, the clock moves a little bit. Some clocks are slow. Some clocks are fast. They can't find the pastor's clock. Where's the pastor's clock? Someone has it back in their room. They're using it for a fan. And you ask yourself... Are the people whose clocks are going fast and are really spinning and are sinning a lot versus the ones that are barely moving and not sinning much, who is having more fun? 
Who is having a better time down here? And we're if not thoughtful about it. Maybe the people, the clocks are really moving, are having more fun. But Jesus said, if you take two groups of people, and one group is absolutely fully devoted to God, and the other group, halfway, lukewarm. At the end of their lives, if you total up all the fun they've had, which group will have more fun when it's all done? Jesus said, Is it really true that if you will get more out of life with Jesus than away from Jesus? Who will have more fun when it's all done? Governor Ventura, who was the governor of Minnesota, had been a world wrestler. On national television in a debate, when someone asked if he was religious, says religion is for weak people. I am not a weak person. Religion is only for those people who can't make it, aren't strong enough to make it on their own. Bill Gates before he left Microsoft, said, I don't have time for religion. It's not worth it to me. Got to make money. Use his time for something else. It says in the tree, you will not surely die. You will be as gods. You'll be better off if you stay away from God. You don't need God. I asked a girl this week in Bible studies, wonderful girl. But I said, if, you, uh, if your parents were to die or you go out on your own, we you still keep the Sabbath? She said, I don't know. <laughs> I'm looking at a screen on my computer that says, taste and see that the Lord is good. See, that's the question. Do you really believe that the God is going to be good, and if you keep the Sabbath, it will be good? Or are you afraid that that will be something that will take life away? It's not going to be worth it. Is God worth it? The famous story in a book about these uh, people in Russia they began to get acquainted with a call porter. And before they fully got converted, the call porter had a box of books that he had extra. He said, I need to put this somewhere. Can you keep it for me? They kept this box of gorgeous books worth hundreds of dollars that the call porter would need. They put it in the back, forgot. And one day their dogs were back there in that and destroyed that box of books. All the books destroyed. They were sick. They could not pay back these books. What could they do? The call porter came back and he said, do you have that box? No, the dogs destroyed it. And the call porter said, let's kneel down and pray. And they knelt down and prayed. And they went back. And instead of these books all dog-eared and wet and strewn all over the room, all the books were back perfect in the box, sealed up with the tape back on the box. Is God worth it? And we count on that all the time. I had a church member of La Sierra. Got excited about a professor of La Sierra that had a whole Wi-Fi internet system. I was with the group that went to India. All these people from India were in the room ready to buy this Wi-Fi system that this Adventist was going to sell. And this guy said, Pastor Dan, if we make this money, I will, I will put all your mission trips for the rest of your life. If you want to quit pastoring, I'll take care of you. If we can just sell and they couldn't get that stupid Wi-Fi system to work once. They're giving cakes and drinks to these rich people. Hold on, it'll work, it'll work. It never worked. One of my members put in $700,000 to make a... Lost it all. Where is God? Someone called me the other day, Pastor Dan, the Iraqi money is going to devalue. If you have a lot of money, it'll all of a sudden be worth a huge amount. They're going to take all those zeros off, Pastor Dan. If you give me $1,000, I will guarantee you, you'll have 100000 in a month. I said, how many people have invested? He said, I have 100000 already. You have to have it by noon tomorrow. I went to Hilda. Is it worth it? Take 1000 get 100000 Might lose. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? Give your life to God and go all in. I was in a home Thursday night. Family to our church, though I had not met them yet. Accident rolled, car rolled four times Sunday. 23-year-old is dead. There was his wife. There was a four-year-old kid in the car with the accident. Niece, mother's in the hospital. They're all thanking God that the ones are okay, but what about the 23-year-old? An engineer for Northrop already finished his school, getting his MBA. Is it worth it? Where was God? Where was the hedge? Where was the protection? 
Anyway, I'd like to talk about Job in a, in a few minutes we have here today. If you have a Bible, you want to follow the text. I don't know if all this will be up on the screen. There we go. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He had seven sons and three daughters, ten kids. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and a large number of servants. He was the greatest among all the people in the East. And his sons used to take turns holding feasts in their homes and inviting their sisters to eat and drink with them. This is the way it's supposed to be. You obey God, he will bless you, and you will be the best. And all these things will be right. But the Bible says Satan is wandering around the universe, and he, God says to him, hey, where have you come from? Oh, I've been roaming around in the world. Have you seen my servant Job, that he is obedient, and he is upright in all that he does? There was no one like him. Here comes the argument in the book of Job. Satan says, of course he does that. Are you kidding me? Look what you have done for him. Does he, Job fear God for nothing? You have put a hedge around him. Nothing bad can happen to him. But if you take that away, he'll give it up on you, and he'll walk away from you. You stretch out your hand, and he will curse you to your face. He is saying that the only reason people follow God is what they can get out of it. Get a blessing. Get rich. Get something. It has to be something that will give you a blessing. If you uh, lower my taxes, I'll vote for you. If you'll help me make my money, make a little more money, if you'll do this for me, if you'll guide me to the right husband or wife, if you do this, God, then I will be faithful to you. I will go all in. If I'm going to count the cost, God, you have to give me more than I put in, or it's not worth it. A professor told me about a young girl that was at La Sierra who was rich, unbelievably rich, but she never showed it off. She never dressed like it. She never had a car like it. She just wanted to live simple, and someone said to her, how come, you know, you've got all this, why don't you live a little? And he said, then I would never know if my friends were really with me, for me, or would they just be with me because they wanted to come to my house and kind of piggyback off what I have. And so I live like this, so I know that if people are my friends, they are with me for me and not for what I have. Kierkegaard has a famous story about the prince who uh, fell in love with a girl, a peasant girl in a little village, and uh, wanted to win her, but was afraid that if he goes there with all his king stuff and all his army and the limousine and all the caravan, that that would, that that would tempt her, but not him. And so he takes all that away. And he, and he wins her heart, and then when he takes her back to this town, when everyone is bowing, she realizes she has married the prince and the future king. And God is the same, and he wants to know, are you really with him for him and not for the stuff? And God wants to know if Job will be faithful, so he lets Satan do what he does. And the Bible says, Job lost everything. God allows Satan to take away the hedge. He said, don't hurt him. And when he takes away the hedge, stuff begins to happen. It says that Job loses every one of his ten children, all of his animals, and all of his servants are killed. Now we're going to see if Satan is right. What will Job do? But the Bible says Job tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell to the ground in worship. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And it says, in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Then it says, God allowed him to touch his body. He had covered with boils. He's using pottery, trying to scrape it. Miserable, if you've ever had a boil. And now his wife joins in and says, just give it up. Just turn God and die. And Job says, you were talking like we accept good from God and not trouble? Job is still believing that all evil comes from God. He's still buying into this. Then we have the rest of the book where the three friends come. I can only boil down a couple verses. And these guys that Job, Job is beginning to be pretty mad. And he says he opens his mouth and he curses. Not God, he curses the day of his birth, which is pretty close. 
It was a curse the day that I was brought into the world. And then the three friends open up, and they just say, chapter 34, verse 11, God repays a man for what he has done. This is called the law of karma or the law of restitution. If you do good, you'll get good. If you do bad, you'll get bad. God is absolutely fair, and everything that you do will get paid back exactly square with whatever you do. Therefore, if you're suffering, you must have sinned someplace, and you are getting exactly what you deserve. Is that true? Is that the way God is? People are always very kind and comforting in these stories, trying to make sense of all of God. I've got a whole list of them. I'm not sure you're going to remember all of them. You go to a hospital, some of the suffering people begin to give you their wisdom. God is letting this happen to you because he has some lesson for you to learn. God is letting this happen because you have sinned somewhere and he wants you to learn that. He, God is just because it's an honor. That some people are honored to be able to handle more suffering than others. Or this person died because God knew they were going to fall away later. Some reason people are trying to give to defend God. And here are these three guys are trying to say, it's because you sinned. Job is willing to admit that maybe it is true that God does bless people who obey him and punishes people who disobey. He's, he's not that far yet. But he says, even if that was true, I do not deserve this. I was innocent. I have not sinned worth this. I had a lady stand at the counter in my house one time, lives down the street, teacher of last year for many, many years, fell down, had, had, had brain trouble ever since. She said to me, I don't think I was this bad. Where did you get a picture of God like that? I don't think I was this bad. I had a friend of mine get Lou Gehrig's disease. He said, I, I, I don't think I did anything that deserves this. Where did you get this picture of God? If you do good, God will bless you. You want to give me another mic? Is this going to be better? I hope so. Sorry, I know we're going in and out. Is that better? Can you hear me? Do I need to preach it all over again? Job goes back and forth, just like we all do. Someday he holds on to God. Job 19, verse 25, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that in the end he will stand upon the earth, and in my flesh I will see God. I'm going to stay with God, and it's going to work out someday. Other days he's so mad and so frustrated and hurt, he wants to sue God. He says, I want to find God. If I could just find wherever he is and sit him down, I would... Have it out with him. I would state my case before him. He wants God to show up and have it out. And say, Come on, God, this is not fair. I don't deserve this. I don't have time to go through all the rest of the book. But in the end, he sticks with God. And he says, no matter what, I am not going to give up on God. Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. With all of his questions about God, he is not going to give up. And God says to the three friends, I am angry with you because you have not spoken of me what is right as my friend Job has spoken about me. And now we come to the end of the book. And it says that Job gets everything back. Now that God knows that Job will be with him no matter what, he allowed Satan to do this cosmic experiment and check it all out, take everything away, and Job has stayed faithful. Yes, he had questions. Yes, he struggled, but he stayed with God. Now God knows he has Job's heart, and now it says he gives everything back. All ten children come, makes new children for them all, and it says in the second half of his life, it was better than the first. And he gets all the animals back. Job 42, verse 12, so the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life more than he in the beginning, and every single thing is exactly doubled. Camels, donkeys, everything, double what he had before. And Pastor Schiffer and the sanctuary team asked me in this series to speak, will it be better than before? You come to Christ. You give up whatever it is you had before, whatever life you had out there in the world. You give that up. Will God bring you back to zero? 
And will he make it better than whatever you had before? When you count the cost, add up the pluses and the minuses, will it be better or will it not? What can we expect from God? Is what God did for Job available to everybody or just once in a while? Is what happened to Job an example of what can happen here or only when we get to heaven? He'll make it all up to you. Those are the questions. A rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, what do I have to do to be saved? And the rich young ruler said, okay, keep all the commandments. I've done that since I was a kid. Jesus says, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Come and follow me. He walks away. It's not worth it. That adds it up. The disciples begin to debate with Jesus. Come on, you know, what? What was that? They believe in this law of retribution. Is that if you do good, you should get good. He must be blessed. What? Jesus talks about it for a while. Finally, they say, well, what is in it for us? We've lost everything to follow you. What is in it for us? And Jesus says in this famous verse, Matthew 29, verse 19, whoever has lost property, houses, family, whatever you've given up, I will pay it back a hundred times as much and eternal life. Is it true? Is it true that if you give your life to God, he will make it better than before? Yes or no? What is the evidence? He doesn't tell the rich young ruler that. He doesn't say, if you'll sell everything and give it to the poor, I'll make it up to you 100 to 1. He tells the disciples that. But now you and I know the verse. He wants that rich young ruler to value it just for him. Give it all up. To be with Jesus will be enough. What do you think? Is it worth it? Jesus says, if you'll pay tithe, I will open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing so much that you cannot receive it. Matthew 6, verse 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Better than before? Daniel chapter 1, they come to the king. They, want to eat the, they don't want them to eat the king's food. They say, no, give us a test, and we'll see if we do better than them. And No, that'll be worse for you. We're always afraid. Maybe it'll be worse if I really go with God and go all in. No, you try it. And they come out ten times better. The verse in Matthew 13 says, The good soil, God will multiply 30 times, 60 times, 100 times. I've used the parable for many, many years. Tiger Woods calls me. I've converted him to Christ on the radio. He says, I want to give you a gift, Pastor Dan. Meet me at Beverly Hills. We go to a car lot. He says, I want to buy you any car. And I'll... You know, here's a smart car for 13000 Here's a BMW convertible for seventy, And here's a Tesla for 200000 I want to be humble. I'm a pastor. I choose the smart car. I'll just lose a little car. That's enough. No, I talk about, I'm rich. I'll let, okay, okay, okay. I'll take the BMW. Why not the Tesla? I'm paying for it all. As long as I'm paying for it, why not go for the best? And I've said to college students all over the world, if God is paying for it, why stop at 30-fold or 60-fold? Why not go for the 100-fold? He says, whatever you give up for me, I will give it to you 100 to 1. Is it true that it will be better than before? Here's the theology in one minute before we're done. When God created Adam and Eve, he made Adam and Eve filled with brain cells that would last forever. They were going to be able to think the deepest thoughts and study the secrets of the universe forever. That's the capacity of what the human brain was going to be capable of doing. There was going to be a world of incredible happiness and pleasure, sexuality and sensuality, incredible. Now we have a fall. And sometimes it's tempting to think that if you give your life to Christ, he will redeem you back, he will reset the clock to zero, and you will be back where we started. No, that is not what God promises. He will not just put you back to where Adam was when he fell. He will put you back to where Adam was going to be after an eternity of growing in perfection. That's where God wants to take you, better than before. That's what the Bible promises. Do you believe it? Will you take it seriously or not? Jesus said in John chapter 13, greater works will you do than I do. What does he mean? Does he mean that I will have a job and I will get double of everything I have? 
Does he mean that he will take care of me? I will never get sick. There will never be suffering. There will never be a car accident. There will never be cancer. Doesn't seem to be what it means. What does it mean when he says, I will give you more better than before? Pascal's wager is in a famous, uh, famous argument by Blaise Pascal. And his argument for God is this. The person who doesn't believe in God turns out to be true. He has a little fun in his life, makes some money, but he dies, and it's all over. The person who does believe in God, if he doesn't win, he goes through his life. Yeah, okay, he goes to church and whatever else. Sings a few songs, but then he dies. They're equal. Each one is dead. Each one is gone. If the person who bets against God, and there is a God, has to stand there and watch a group of people go to heaven and live forever in happiness and incredible and know that he lost out. The person who bets on God, and it turns out to be true, gets to be with God forever. And Pascal said, it is worth it. Just on the odds of upgrade and downgrade, it is worth it. The upside is better to go with Christ. You will be better than before. I began to total up in my life. I don't know how much I have paid in tithes and offerings in uh, 40 years, almost as a pastor. But let's just say I average $15,000 a year, inflation calculated. That's 600000 I have paid to God and the church so far, plus mission trips, plus whatever else. You think what I could do with $600,000? There's the RV, there's the ski boat, there's a cabin on the lake, on the ocean. Travel around the world, I could have done a lot of things with $600,000. I spent a lot of Sabbaths working. I could have been watching college football or playing golf, whatever. I suppose people could do the Will Chamberlain lifestyle, you know, 20,000 women. So you give up a few things. But on the other side, I have been all over the world. I have godly friends all over the world. I have lived a clear conscience life. I have not had to have any abortions or any hangovers or ever been in jail. People know that when I say something, they know it's true. There is this balance. I have mission projects all over the world. I can go to any country, and people will come to me and meet me at the airport. We have $2 million of projects all over the world. I have this spiritual GPS that whenever I have a tough question, I can pray, and there's a whisper that comes into my mind guiding me what to do. Happens all the time, and I know that was God. That's what I have. I am part of a church family and a community that has added so much richness, richness to my life. I have been far blessed compared to the 600,000 I've given away. You may not exactly get everything that you would like to have, but I will tell you this. It will always be better than before. It will always be better than whatever you give up for him. And he says it will be worth 100 to 1. Do you believe it? Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I thank you for the young people who chose to wrestle with this text and this idea because it is what every one of us wrestles with. Is it really worth it? to put your whole life on God, to be all in, to put everything into it. Is it really worth it, God? And we are going to stand here today before you and say, it is worth it. It may not be by the world's scale, it may not be money, it may not be doubling all of our animals or our stocks or something else. But we believe at the end of the game, it is always worth it to have you in our lives, Father. Just you alone is worth it. And if I can pray that everyone here will know that at this point of their life, don't wait 40 years to know it, to know it today, is that if you go all in with God and be absolutely white hot for God, you will never be sorry. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.